Lucky good they are not very noisy, otherwise these people make hell of a noise in our Friday. <laughs> we conduct our Friday talk. Tonight we have a visitor, but he is not a stranger. He is one of my disciples. He has become a member of Buddhist Missionary Society, I think nearly twenty-five years ago. Then at that time I have given him a name also, Anand. So he was very keen in corresponding with us. Finally he decided to visit us. So his first visit was in 1975. He has gone back. He was ordained in America. Finally he decided to come here and receive this ordination. So we conducted this high ordination, so Upasampada ceremony in 1980. So many members I think still can remember. So we went to Sri Lanka also for his further studies to get some missionary experience. Now he is doing a wonderful service in America, more on welfare activities than preaching and teaching, by attending to sick people who are suffering from various kind of unwanted sicknesses and homeless people. His services were recognized by the government. Now he gets support also from American government. Uh, news always appear in the newspapers about him and what he is doing as a Buddhist monk. And he is the only Buddhist monk of this kind <laughs> in the whole world. So I am proud to introduce him as my disciple. And I have another disciple, he is Canadian, now working in uh, South Korea, Piananda. I think you can remember that book, Why Meditation? He has written this when he was here with me, Odin. So, tonight we are very happy. So I invite him to tell us what he is doing there. How Buddhism <coughs> is recognized or spreading in America. And what are the things that we can do to promote Buddhism? in that part of the world, and what they can do for us. So I invite Reverend Suhita Dhamma to address you. Uh, good evening. Uh, first I should tell you, uh, in the States now, along with a lot of the newcomers to America, uh, we have uh, approximately there's over 4,000 uh, Buddhist temples uh, in the United States of America, including Hawaii and Alaska. All the Buddhist tra traditions are represented uh, in the states, as well as every known religion in the world you can find in California. If you can't find that religion in California, it doesn't exist. So a very in interesting thing is beginning to happen uh, in America is that a lot of unity is beginning to develop among the different religious uh, traditions. And one of the reasons for that is, is that we have a lot of social problems in America along with unemployment, homelessness, uh, as the Venerable said, the unwanted sickness 
what we, most people know as uh, as AIDS, uh, crime, uh, a lot of social problems, a lot of unrest among the youth uh, due to the changes in the techno uh, technology of the country is everything is evolving uh, into computers. Um, the educational system is evolving into computer uh, ri computerized uh, educational system. So now a lot of children who go to school, say in the first grade, uh, by the time they reach second grade, they begin their studies and work uh, in computers. Uh, due to the stress of uh, uh, mother and father both working uh, to support the family. Uh, we have a large uh, number of single mothers uh, who have to support their uh, children. Uh, so we have a number of very stressful uh, social problems that we have to uh, try to help people with. Uh, with my particular work that I'm doing up in uh, Richmond, California was, uh, I moved to Richmond, California, and we was doing some work with the homeless. And we set up actually a Buddhist, little Buddhist monastery, and I was the only monk staying there at the time. So being a, a Buddhist monk, wherever the Buddhist monk lived, then his living quarters automatically becomes the Vihara. So we actually set up the little Buddhist temple there. And I was doing some work with the homeless in the area. And I found out that there were two people who were homeless staying in a shelter, uh, like a mission, who had AIDS. And they had less than six months to live. One of them had less than six months to live. And he didn't have any place to go. Um, except stay in the shelter. But the shelter didn't want him to stay there because uh, most people are afraid of this uh, new illness. And I had two extra rooms at the place where I was staying, so I asked them to bring him there and let, let them come and stay with me. And uh, the person lived uh, nine months with me uh, during that time, I didn't put any judgment values uh, on him uh, to treat him any differently because one of the main practices that we have is the practice of metta, uh, loving kindness, and karuna, compassion. And due to this treatment of slowly uh, listening to what he had to say and to understand that individual person, this person was able to come to total terms with his illness and made a complete change in his own lifestyle from the moment, uh, from the time that he lived with us up until the time that he died. Um, I can say to tell you this, that to experience a very young person, like 30, 31, uh, who had to experience such a dreadful illness uh, where as the immune system is totally torn apart and you are subject to pick up any infection, uh, like simple small pox could actually kill uh, a person with that disease. And I talked to, he asked me questions because we had a Buddhist shrine and so he would ask me questions about the Buddha, the Buddhist shrine, and I have a lot of uh, Chief Reverend's books on hand, and he would read the little booklets and things. And he decided that uh, before he died that he wanted to become a, a, a Buddhist on his own. I didn't coerce him or anything. Uh, just practiced trying to be the good friend. And uh, this person was able to die an extremely peaceful death, so much so that the benefits that we actually receive from the government is actually uh, the offering of the merit that is derived from this particular person. Uh, it was actually through him, through his own experiences, and finally through the experience of his own death. He was able to come to such total terms 
that uh, it just completely uh, amazed a lot of the medical professional people uh, how this person was able to come to such complete peaceful terms. It was one of the most peaceful deaths I have ever seen. If I could ever be so fortunate to have a death that peaceful, I would not have to worry about where I was going. Was I going to heaven, or nirvana, or wherever? Uh, this person was able to come to total terms with his whole existence, even though it was a very short existence. Um, we continue in our work, uh, working with uh, people with this illness, and gradually we slowly became known uh, to a lot of government officials, uh, city officials, and uh, a year ago they gave us uh, official funding and this funding was also renewed for this year as well, 1990 through 91. Uh, plus we received uh, some funding from three other uh, foundations uh, in America. And as I look back on the work that we was doing, I remember going to once to an interreligious uh, conference we had in Los Angeles. And someone mentioned uh, the Christian religions and other religions have all types of social service programs. How come uh, the Buddhists uh, don't have social service programs? One of the things, reasons for that is, is that when people have certain problems within their family or within their community, it is quite natural for you to go to the f head of the family first. Then if that can re be resolved there, you will go to the uh, local e elder of your community. Then, if it can't be resolved there, then automatically you would go to the Buddhist temple. And the Buddhist temple is the hub of the community. And in my studies about Buddhism, and especially in the Vinaya, and especially with things dealing with right livelihood, um, I couldn't find anywhere where it goes against the principles of the teachings of Buddha. It is a major part of Buddhism for us to be kind, generous, and helpful to our fellow beings, especially beings that may be suffering in some form of an, or another. And I came across a picture uh, of the Buddha taking care of a sick monk. And I found that picture when I was in Sri Lanka and I saved it. So now we are trying to find someone to draw a large one for us. That's going to be our motto, is showing the Buddha taking care of the sick monk, uh, which means uh, at that time I had to physically uh, take care of the two people that were staying with me with that illness myself. Uh, I've had some experience in my previous monastic training as in nursing, so I know something about nursing, so I know how to nurse a sick person. And um, my field of study was in the field of psychology, so, which is quite compatible with uh, Buddhism, especially when we look into Abhidhamma uh, and bringing together Western psychology, Eastern psychology, especially Abhidhamma, and the practice of meditation, trying to overcome whatever difficulties or problems we might have with ourselves first. And, uh, this is one of the major practices that we have. It's the metta meditation, metta karuna meditation, uh, vipassana meditation. And when we are working with the people who probably have problems with drugs, uh, homelessness, then we use those types of meditations, but in a Zen style of a discipline. So it could have some type of a structure. Because a lot of times you'll find a lot of people who have those difficulties uh, lack, to, lack a certain amount of dis discipline or uh, structure. <laughs> uh, one of the most interesting things that's happening uh, in America is quite unique is that uh, we have created a Buddhist Congress, a National Buddhist Congress, where all the Buddhist traditions have come together uh, to dialogue. In other words, uh, we have Thai Buddhists, we have Burmese Buddhists, we have Sri Lankan Buddhists, we have Japanese, we have Vietnamese, we have Lao, we have Tibetan, we have Chinese, we have Korean. Yeah. And 
Buddhism in America is looking at all the cultural parts as well as looking at the teachings of the, of the Buddha. So we can distinguish what is cultural and what is the teachings of the Buddha. So at our temple, we are taking the best of all the cultural parts and teaching the Americans who are interested in Buddhism how to act and what to do if you go to one of the different uh, ethnic uh, Buddhist temples. Uh, if you want to go to the Thai temple, then we should know how to act and in the Thai temple. If we go to the Sri Lankan temple, uh, Tibetan temple, then you should know how to react to that Pacific uh, temple. This is a way of teaching uh, the Americans how to get used and know the culture of others. Most of the time when a new culture is going to uh, uh, countries, one of the best ways to learn the culture is through the food. The second best way is to learn the culture uh, through dance, through music, and then also through uh, the re religious experience of the uh, people. So through this uh, work, um, Thai temples, the Theravada temples, Mahayana temples, uh, Vajrayana temples, when the new people came, they didn't know how to go through the American system of setting up a temple. So sometimes some would have problems. Like you couldn't set up a Buddhist temple in a residential area. But if you set up a Buddhist monastery, you can set that up in a residential area. And in some of the residential areas, especially if you move into a very affluent area, uh, they might not, the neighbors might not would like the idea of having this strange religion uh, right next door to say a $500,000 to a million dollar house. Um, like I'll give you a good example. In, uh, I don't know if you know of Shilai Temple, which is part of Phu Quan San uh, in Taiwan. They just built the largest Buddhist temple in America, and it's called Shilai uh, Temple, and they spent over $30 million to build this temple. But it was placed in a very affluent area, so they was having problems, and the people went to the city council to try to stop them from building this temple. And a very extraordinary thing happened, and like I mentioned, our interfaith council, we have Muslims, we have Catholics, we have Protestants, all the religions who wish to belong to this council and who want to work together for the benefit of the community, we all went together in one group with one voice to the City Hall of Los Angeles, defeated the people who didn't want the temple in their neighborhood. And the reason they didn't want the temple in their neighborhood was purely on racial basis but we defeated them, all the religions. Not one was excluded from that because we worked in unity and it was for the benefit of mankind. And this is something that is happening that is quite unique uh, in America, quite unique. And it's beginning to really grow and develop. Of course, we still have problems with, uh, there are still some groups or some people who really just don't like uh, Eastern ideas, uh, Eastern religions, uh, other religions, period. So we deal with them by trying to present the teachings of Buddhism as much as possible through our actions. Because we all know that actions always speak louder than words. So we try to present the teachings of the Buddha through our actions, uh, especially through metta, loving kindness, through compassion, and also through tolerance. So a lot of times when the Buddhist monks, we first there, it wasn't easy for Buddhist monks in America, um, especially when we wear the bright chaffron color or robes. You know, it's just like you take this red color, you know, and place it in front of a bull, right? Then what happens? That bull will charge you, right? It's the same with that saffron color. If you go out into the public in the saffron color, for some reason, it does something to the American psychic. 
they seem like they want to attack you, uh, to say something that's not nice or that's not kind. So what happened, we decided to wear the darker color. <laughs> so uh, they would say Hare Krishna to us, uh, anything. And, and a lot of monks, especially uh, the monks from, the, uh, from this part of the world, they were afraid, you know, they would get nervous, you know. Like, you know, it, it would just make them feel like they didn't want to go out. They felt like, like uh, something strange. So we decided to adapt a little darker color. And so most of the darker colors are used, but we still use the saffron colors and things in the uh, robes uh, at the temples. And you still see saffron robes. Uh, now people are becoming more familiar with the Buddhist monk. You know, Mahayana Buddhist monks, uh, especially Japanese Buddhist monks have been around uh, in America a long time, a hundred years to be exact, a hundred years, over a hundred years. But their tradition was different. Um, and by the changes they made in their tradition in Japan, they were able to relate uh, to American culture. Um, there are a lot of people want us to follow Buddhism exactly 100% like we have in, uh, uh, you find in Asia, you know. Like in America, we can't go Pindapat, for example. Um, we have, but we have Pindapat uh, programs at the various temples from time to time to maintain the uh, tradition. So we had to adapt a little bit. But from my Catholic background, I came to the idea, and what gave me this idea was uh, my former Catholic monastery that I was in now has a Zendo, and they practice Zen meditation. So if the Catholics can adapt Zen, then how, why can't Buddhists adapt the social service programs that they have uh, according to the traditions in the West? Um, why not have Buddhist schools? Why not have a Buddhist social service department? Why not have Buddhist hospitals, nursing homes, uh, child care centers, you know? And again, what gave me this idea was working with the Indo-Chinese refugees from 1975 through uh, 1980. Now, if I'm a refugee and I come to this new country, I don't have money or nothing, and this organization helps me to get on my feet, then we all know I'm going to feel indebted to that particular organization. So then naturally I'm going to go over to that particular organization. Later on, uh, many of the Indo-Chinese refugees reversed. You know, once they learned that uh, freedom of religion uh, is separate from the government and everything in America, uh, it's, it's totally separate. And once they learned this, they wanted to return to their roots. So they returned uh, to the temples and started to develop the Buddhist temples in America. Uh, now with our program, which was like an experiment now, other Buddhist temples are beginning to develop various social service programs as well. Um, we don't exclude. Uh, I make it very clear that it's, it's a Buddhist temple and it's a Buddhist program, a social service program, but it doesn't matter to us what your religion is. It doesn't matter to us what your color is. It doesn't matter to us uh, how you got involved in these difficulties. What matters is from that moment that you come to us, if you're willing to try to make some changes in your life without force, then we are willing to try to help you the best way we can. So we give you some ideas how you could do it then you can take these ideas and apply them. And Chief Reverend's books is one of the best uh, tools that I have because his books really reach the everyday working person. You know, people who have gone to universities and have good educations and things like that, you can learn about Buddhism almost at any major university. You can get a PhD, MA, BA, or whatever in uh, Buddhist studies in America. But the average everyday person uh, don't necessarily have access to these things or have the inclination 
to want to do these things. Uh, so a lot of people in the San Francisco Bay Area, they see me and I go to all the different areas where these people are and they know me now. And a lot of them trust me because they know that I'm not placing a judgment on them. Because most of the people that we do work with, like I said, are working with, uh, have drug problems, uh, homelessness, and also various uh, illnesses such as AIDS and things like that. So they know me now and uh, they know that we are trying to help them. I get a lot of calls, like I got a call about a month month and a half or oh, two months ago now, where there was a person who was a Catholic who died, but he wanted to have a Buddhist funeral. And the reason for this was that he was, re he was rejected by his own religion because of his illness. He was rejected. And I decided that I would do a Catholic Buddhist funeral. <laughs> and we created a Catholic Buddhist funeral. So his family decided to show up for the funeral, were able to overcome their grief and things, and they were so impressed by it that they were able to release their own guilt by rejecting uh, their son uh, because of his illness, which was through fear. It was through fear, not education, through fear. Uh, they loved him but it was the fear, the fear of the illness. And uh, so we created a Catholic Buddhist funeral. Um, I have created a Jewish Buddhist funeral. Um, we use the tools that we have at hand. When a person comes to want to know something about Buddhism, I can't sit and tell that person, there's no such thing as a God, you know. God. Uh, can't do anything for you. If I do something like that to uh, that particular person, then I lost that person's interest. Uh, to me, if you mention the term God, then there are billions and trillions of, God, of gods. Because if we had belief in, the, in that system of belief, then my belief in God would be a personal belief. And say like if everyone here believe in some form of a god or another, then we have about at least 150 or 200 gods right here in this room. So imagine how many gods you have in Malaysia. Yeah. For without mine, you couldn't believe in a god. Mine is a, for, a forerunner of everything. That I am totally convinced of in the Buddhist teachings, is that mine is a forerunner of everything. And we can make changes. Uh, I was talking to someone today about meditation and they said that they wanted to become uh, Sotapatthana and I told them that I wanted to become a Bodhisattva. <laughs> <laughs> Stick around for a while because through the experience of learning and developing and growing, I want to take each day at a time, you know. So, this is how we live. It's a gradual path. I know we really want to feel that we can reach and cut off this cycle of existence, you know, instantly. This is the world that we live in. In the 1960s, we had what was called LSD, instant enlightenment, but that was not the case. It was the same with the teachings of the Buddha. It's very gradual, very slow. And one day, I can guarantee you this, one day, through your own individual practice of Buddhism, you will see your own progress. You will see it. Because we see our true progress in our practice is not when we are sitting in meditation, but when we are dealing with other beings in our work, in our play, in our, any activity in our daily life. That's where we are see how well we are doing in our practice. And then we'll know that we're on the right path, that we are truly trying to follow the teachings of the Dharma. One of the things, perhaps, a lot of inspiration I get from here is when I come to Chief Reverend Temple and I see all the activities going on here, uh, a lot of young people going to the temple and everybody's bustling around and 
getting ready for different activities, and sometimes you have busloads of people come here to this temple, you know, thousands of people piling into the temple. Uh, it's very impressive. But also, we have to practice the Dhamma in, a, in an active way, in a meditative way, meditation and action. Whether we are putting up a flag, sweeping the floor, or whatever uh, that we are doing, then that is also should be incorporated into our meditation practice. Um, I do quite a bit of uh, walking meditation, but the type of walking meditation that one can do is if you're on the way to the shop to do some shopping, you know, to be totally aware of your surroundings, to aware of what you're doing the awareness, building up the awareness. Um, this keen awareness will slowly break into where we have little glimpse of insights into our own nature and into our own uh, conditioning, like they use in psychological terms, to recondition ourselves, uh, to purify our minds, uh, body, speech. and use this as an active meditation, and when you use it as an active meditation, then your meditation actually become a 24-hour meditation practice. Uh, we have a little joke that we usually do at our temple. In the afternoon after lunch, we have about an hour, uh, two hours to where we rest. So we have on our door a sign that says, horizontal meditation. <laughs> so, so this gives you an idea of how to use it in a practical way. But at the same time, we have to be very strong and very firm to our own convictions. You know? And that's one thing that the Buddha gave us. He said, come and see, you know, and through your own convictions, through your own practice, you will see. And there are many, many, many ways uh, for us to develop. Also in... Uh, in the states, uh, like I was saying, the social service programs is one of the main emphasis that we have now uh, going on, and that's the first step. Uh, the second step is education, uh, creating educational programs, uh, developing a Sunday school, uh, eventually developing, hopefully, uh, uh, we have a high school program. I go um, uh, once a week. Uh, to a Catholic high school, and uh, I teach about Buddhism uh, to the students. And this is a required course for all the uh, students to take before graduation. It's required that they take comparative religion to understand the religions of others. Uh, the world has slowly become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller uh, through the technology, through the media, and all of this, we know a lot about each other. Uh, we're not separate anymore. Uh, of course, everyone likes to feel that their own culture is the best culture in the world. But the best and true culture in the world is the human culture. This is what the American Indians say, that in their religion, we have an animal nature. If we eat too much, we are like a pig. You know, we fight too much, you know, then we are like another type of an animal. This is our animal nature. So we have to pull away the animal nature and reach the higher nature. And the higher nature to the American Indians is the human nature, or the nature of, uh, of God, as they say in their religion. It is the higher nature, the human nature. We have to work at being human. We have to pull away all the other negative animal-like type tendencies that we have. Uh, if you study about anthropology and go back into the days of the caveman, now you can smile, you see, a nice smile. But in those days, it was a snarl, it was a growl. It meant fighting or something like that in those days. So we can see the animal nature in that sense through uh, anthropology. But now it's a nice smile. But at the same time, we have to work to remove these things and to move, pull the, sh uh, uh, the covers off and look at our own nature and at our own heart. Uh, 
first. And, as, and at the same time, while we are looking at our own nature and our own hearts first, then we try to uh, help others. A unique program that we have that we have in America that I'm trying to talk uh, to Chief Reverend about, which I think would be a very good idea for a, a country like this, but I don't know Chief Reverend's viewpoint on it yet, but I'm going to bring it up now anyway. In fact, um, we have created what is called the Buddhist, Buddhist Ministers uh, Training Program. And one of the reasons for this is that there is a lot of Americans who might not necessarily want to live the life of a Buddhist monk. So we have Buddhist monks, but we also have uh, Buddhist Ministers Program. And um, we have full support of the Buddhist uh, community in America, including Thai Buddhism, Burmese Buddhism, Sri Lankan Buddhism, uh, Lao, Bu Lao Buddhism. You know. uh, traditions that is very straightforward. In Mahayana traditions, these things could be easily adaptable with the Tibetans or with the Vietnamese or with the Chinese. Um, my teacher, first teacher, was from Vietnam, and he came up with the idea of the Buddhist Ministers Training Program. Uh, which was actually started in 1973, and so here it is, 1990, and uh, we have about uh, 52 uh, Buddhist ministers in America who are actually helping in places where there are Buddhist temples, but there are not monks, enough monks to take care of the temples, and they work hand in hand with the monks together. It's not. There's, there isn't any opposition between the two groups. Uh, we are created from the Anagarika. It's one of the first steps. Um, and then there's a gradual training, and it takes up to about seven years. Even if you wanted to become a, a regular Theravada uh, Mahayana Buddhist monk in America, it will take you almost seven years. Uh, the Upasampada is not really given lightly, but one program that we are starting is to start the novice training program like you have here, so that young people can get experience in the, the monk's life. So we are starting that in, in the States now as well. And I think that would be it's an excellent program for countries where they don't have Buddhist monks or where it would probably be good for to have ministers to help uh, preserve the teachings of the Buddha. And there are many good uh, people who happen to be married, who are excellent Buddhist teachers, who can work hand in hand with the Buddhist monks uh, together to spread the teachings of the Dhamma. This is something that just that is just going to happen because we are going into a new century. And one of the reasons why it's happening in America is, is that America doesn't have a Buddhist tradition, you see. Now, if you study history, and you study the history of religion at the same time, then you will see that as Buddhism moved into different countries, the religion had to adapt. It had to. Like, for example, when uh, Sangamitta, the nuns, they went into China, uh, the Buddhist monks, they went into China. The first group that went into China, they died. And why? The Chinese people at that time wasn't used to people that went around with bows begging for food, was one. The climate was fierce. They happened to land in China in the winter, you know. And believe me, I can tell you, <laughs> if you go to the east coast of, uh, of America, and you dress like this, you're not going to last long. You, know, you have to use common sense. And that's a lot of times we leave that out. And the Buddhas, the Buddha taught us that we definitely should use common sense. He allowed certain things that had to be done. We have to put on something to keep warm. So when this was done, the, gradually the religion already in that country penetrated and absorbed into Buddhism as well. So you have the culture of other religions mixture of into a part of uh, Buddhism. 
and you find it out through all of, of, uh, of the Buddhist countries or places where Buddhism is prominent. So now in America, with all the Buddhist traditions, imagine this, all the Buddhist traditions, all of the Christian traditions, all the other religions that they have in America, their traditions, you see, when you, you go to America and you're a new person, it's the same with the language, English language, which is totally different from England. And why is, what is the difference? Okay, the difference is that Chinese words, Vietnamese words, Spanish words, African words, words that have meaning and become very popular are placed into the English language in America. It's an evolving language. In a hundred years, Americans will not be speaking English as we know it because it's an evolving language. You know, you have that here. You know, different dialects. You know, like when you uh, talk English here, then you add la, right la, <laughs> see? But that la comes from the Chinese la, to give emphasis, you see? It's the same with Spanish. If you go to Los Angeles, you can hear 96 languages in one day. So imagine a culture like that. Now the same is going to happen to this country eventually too, and eventually to the whole world. So we have to prepare ourselves for these things, for change. The nature of change is change. And we have to prepare ourselves for this. And so that's why we are taking the best of everything in Buddhism, the best of the cultures, because it is far better to place your hands together like this than to shake hands, right? It's nicer. It's, it's very beautiful. It has a meaning. It means I respect that within you which is trying to find ultimate truth. I respect. But shaking hand doesn't really mean that, you see? So it's a lot of things that is coming into American culture now that is quite interesting and very important. And this is the external parts. We learn what did the Buddha teach? What is cultural? What, is be what will benefit us culturally as a nation of people? to respect each other's culture, because everyone wants to be respected. But first we have to respect ourselves. And we respect ourselves through practice, first knowing who we are, what we are, where we're coming from, where are we going. We learn these things through the practice of meditation. If we want to be moral people, we have to learn how to be moral ourselves. We can't beat morality into a person we have to teach it very young, very young. But sometimes we fall and we make mistakes. So when we fall and make mistakes, then we have to pull ourselves up again and keep on, keep on walking one step at a time. Not instant, but one step at a time. And then gradually when we look back, we can see how far we have, we have gone and how much we have gained through our own experience of the religion, of the practice. Religion was meant to uplift it wasn't meant to create fear. There's nothing in Buddhism where the Buddha taught that uh, to create fear, but to create confidence and perseverance, uh, harmony, compassion, loving kindness, all the things that are noble things, that we consider noble, where we become the, eventually the perfect human being. And so we work towards these things. So uh, that much I can tell you is what's going on and it's quite unique right now in America. Uh, so I think I will stop at that point. Okay. It's still good time. Yeah. It's very interesting and very awakening talk that he has given giving some informations and the situation of Buddhism in America and certain problems and facilities. He was from 1979 
the resident monks in advised me not to go out by wearing this yellow robe. People tease us, disturb us, or sometimes can beat us. Because they have made a dark robe just like uh, Chinese or the Korean monks or the Catholic priest robes, they cover the robe with that dark robe. They gave me that one to wear and go out. I told I'm not used to it. Look very funny. <laughs> anyway, I take the risk. I must go out by wearing this saffron color robe. And another monk who also went with me from Calcutta joined with me. So two of us went to London town. Well, we saw people uh, teasing, laughing, booing, and all sort of things. But we did not show our emotions or anger or unhappiness. And we thanked them. We regarded this as the way how they acknowledge and respect us. <laughs> the way how you say sadhu, and we regarded their way of uh, making noise also like that. <laughs> So they could not disturb us. So we were waiting for a taxi. Suddenly, a young man with long hair stopped his taxi and asked, where do you want to go? I said, we want to go to our Buddhist monastery. Then he looked at us. He said, where are you coming from? From which country? What is this dress? Look very funny. <laughs> then I knew he is a hippie, the driver. I told him, do you know we are hippies? <laughs> what? Hippies are not like you. I told him, my dear friend, you must understand we are modern hippies, <laughs> not like you. Then he was very interesting. Then where are you going? I am going to our hippie center, headquarters. Chisik Buddhist society, uh, temple. So he took us and said, this is our hippie center. He also followed us. There were many monks. I said, these are our hippie brothers. <laughs> then I had few booklet, you are responsible, how to overcome your difficulty. This is our message. I gave two copies. Then I asked, how much for your taxi? No, we are hippie brothers. We should not take money. So I saved a few pounds because of hippie son. <laughs> then he asked, when are you going back? He said, tomorrow morning. At what time? Nine o'clock. I will come and take you to the airport. Exactly, he came. At the same time, he did not take money again. Uh, this is the advantage of introducing this yellow robe. <laughs> I think you can remember that story. Even the man who was about to go to hell, remember the color of his son's, reference color of his son's yellow robe. He escaped from hell because of the happiness, cheerfulness, confidence he developed in his mind before his death. That is why the Buddha has introduced this. So he explained the difficulties. Yes, when I was in Washington, I had some difficulties from a girl, you know, who came and disturbed me. <laughs> because I did not change my robe. Another important thing that he mentioned in his talk about the way of life, Vinaya rules, discipline, Monk's way of life. I have mentioned this in my book, What Buddhists Believe, under the chapter of What is Vinaya. Still, our Buddhists have not realized the difference between Dhamma and Vinaya. These are two different things. The trouble with this religion is Buddhism is an excellent religion 
handled by narrow, narrow-minded people all over the world. Very shallow and narrow, their way of doing things. That is why always we are behind. We do not know how to go forward, we are going backward. This is called development of Buddhism. If you go backward, this is called development of Buddhism. What is Vinaya? Before his passing away, the Buddha advised his disciple. He is an enlightened religious teacher who knew everything. He said, in time to come, you may come across a lot of problems and difficulties to maintain the same precept and discipline that I have introduced. But you will be at liberty to amend, to change certain minor rules that I have introduced as Vinaya regarding your way of life. Most of those Vinaya rules are based on manners and traditions and way of life and customs and etiquette. In Indian society 2,500 years ago, now if we are going to follow the same tradition, same way of life in other countries where we live under different tradition, different culture, different climate, we are real stupid people. How can we maintain the same thing? People laugh at us. You can understand. That is why the Buddha has given this advice. Of course, which are immoral, cruel and wicked and harmful under Vinaya rule. They are not entitled to change under any circumstances. But 75% of those Vinaya rules are based on way of life and traditions and customs and manners. Now these are the things that we have to change from time to time if we really want to go forward. Otherwise there will be no place for us. Again he mentioned just now about what happened to a Christian uh, man's funeral. Similar incidents have taken place even in this country. A man who was regarded as a Buddhist, a Chinese, died. His family members wanted to arrange Buddhist funeral rites. Meanwhile, his Christian friends came and told him he is a Christian. He was baptized. Therefore, they want to arrange a Christian funeral rite. When they wanted to get the burial permit, he went to the police station. They found out he was converted into Islam. <laughs> Nobody knew this. Uh, then the Muslim was okay. Now three religious groups are arguing at home whether they, they to give a Buddhist funeral right or Christians or Muslim. Then some of their family members came to see me. What is the Buddhist attitude? Then I told them, we Buddhists do not fight for dead bodies. If they want to carry away, let them carry away. We know what to perform our Buddhist rite without that dead body. It is not very important for us to perform our Buddhist practices. So, these weaknesses that people adapt regarding their marriage and funeral create unnecessary troubles and calamities and violence and bloodshed also. Few years ago, we had a wedding, blessing service in this temple. You'll be surprised to hear, husband is a Methodist, wife is a Catholic. We perform the wedding service in the Buddhist temple. Can you believe? Why? 
husbands want to drag the wife into his church. The wife wanted to drag him into her church. Then the family members also arguing. Then somebody suggested, why not we go to Buddhist temple? <laughs> they came and asked. I said, no problem, because we do not convert anybody. Our duty is to bless. Whether that person is a Christian, so Hindu, so makes no difference to us. So they came. We have performed the blessing service. Settled the problem. But many people do not know how to adjust. Uh, how to adapt himself to settle these things, this can become a very big issue, create a lot of problems. So, this reverend says he is going to start a Buddhist hospital and uh, he wants to, to develop all his activities based on welfare and social activities and mentioned there are about 400 or 4,000 te temples or 4,000 Buddhist centers in America today. I have visited some of those places in 1979 and given some religious talks also and Buddhism is spreading in many people have what churches. Churches are available for sale. People are not interested. And anyone can buy a church. In Los Angeles, I think one of the biggest church was bought by some uh, Hong Kong Chinese monks, you know, they converted into a Buddhist temple. So in England, you can see every Sunday morning how they play pop music in the church, inviting people to come and attend the service. In another church, which appear in the newspaper, and anyway, I'm not going to condemn, I mention what is happening. It's appeared in the newspaper. A church, a Christian priest could not get anybody Sunday morning for his service. So what he did? He opened a bar in the church. <laughs> then people started coming. So after drinking, they start singing louder, and this church become very popular. This appeared in the newspaper. So what is happening to certain religion? Same thing has happened to Buddhism also in many countries. Remember. What happened to Buddhism in China, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and Tibet? Of course, by force, some of them have disturbed. But in certain countries, because the way how Buddhists have organized their religious activities are very weak. Remember this. People never felt that this religion is needed or oh, this is a religion that can do some service to the public. The monks and nuns and all the others, all day and night, praying and worshipping and meditating, but for the public there is nothing. There must be something. When I visited Korea, I remember I was invited to give a talk to a group of monks. And I noticed these monks are not doing very much. Yes, they get into their rooms and meditate day and night. And the Christian missionaries are very active, associate with young boys and girls and going on converting and converting and converting. Today they have converted up to 29% Buddhist. Very easily they can convert because the Buddhist monks and nuns and devotees are not active, not intelligent, I told them. I really appreciate your meditation. You go inside your room, close your eyes, meditate. When you come out and open your eyes, you can see all your young boys and girls who are taken away by Christians. Time has come for you to come out and open your eyes, see what is happening in your country. Now, completely gone. 
because of the laziness and stupidity of the monks and nuns and others. That is why I told you just now, Buddhism is an excellent religion handled by stupid people. I also belong to that too. <laughs> so we had to change our attitude, our way of life. This conservative, narrow-minded way of thinking. You must learn how to organize this religion to go for, forward. Otherwise, there will be no future for us. All of you know, Buddhism is a religion that never disturb the followers of other religions, never interfere with them, never say that they are wrong. Such a gentle religion. Non-Buddhists in many countries respect Buddhism because of this attitude. But we do not know how to organize this. The Buddha did not organize religious activities he preached the Dhamma, he taught us what is right and what is wrong to cultivate our way of life. But it is our duty to organize our activities to introduce the teaching, to impart this knowledge to others, to pave them the correct path. That is why we are trying to do. Uh, that is why so, monks, from various countries visit this place, having heard what we are doing. For the last 20 to 30 years, we have done something to create some sort of good reputation, some services, and now we are getting support also from the public. But still, there are many, many things we had to organize to maintain this religion. Anyway, whatever I say, I have to thank you for the support that you have been giving for all our activities, but still there are many things for us to organize, to consider how to maintain this noble religion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to tell you that helped me to really learn to uh, respect uh, the Buddhist monk's dress is that um, last year in November I attended a conference in Washington, D.C. And at this conference there were a number of uh, African leaders uh, from Africa and when I walked into the conference in this, in this dress, uh, the African leaders, the elders, was extremely delighted and happy. And um, I come to find out that the very highly respected elders in the African tribal communities and the kings of the African communities in the ancient days wore this dress in this style and in this color. So the Buddha was very clever also because he used a royal color at that time and a royal dress for ascetic monks. And when I learned about this at this particular conference, it made me feel very proud to be a Buddhist monk and very extremely proud to wear one of the oldest fashions in the world. This fashion hasn't changed for over 2020, oh, 2,533 years. It's the oldest fashion. So maybe another thousand years this fashion will still be the same. Another 2,000 years more will still be the same. I never have to run to the department store every year to buy the latest fashion, Reeboks, uh, Jordache jeans, and all these things like that. So that gave me the highest respect uh, for the Buddhist monk dress was when I learned that. 
actually the Buddhist monks dressed in the latest model. <laughs> Do you know why? In your case, whatever modern uh, fashion she used, when you go thinner and thinner and thinner, you have to adjust. You have to go back to barber and adjust. When you go put on weight and bigger, and again you have to adjust. But this fashion, whether thin or fat makes no difference, can use forever without any change. Yes, somebody wanted to ask a question? Um, I think I would have to uh, disagree on that. Uh, Japan is one specific example. The Japanese monks over 900 years ago was forced to marry uh, by the government. It's not that they wanted to, it was forced upon them. Over the 900 years, they were able to develop their religion. Uh, after the war with MacArthur, when religious freedom went into Japan, uh, the Japanese uh, priests, um, as they are called, uh, Zen Buddhist monks, uh, do, they are called monks during the training. And these monks uh, began to adapt according to the Western Christian sin, uh, system of uh, organizing their temples. The richest and most successful it was one of very powerful lobby uh, in the American system is the Buddhist temple that is called Jodo Shenshu. It's the Pure Land Temple. They have a lot of power. They have a lot of social programs. They are the only Buddhist ministers who actually act as chaplains in the military service in America. They are recognized by the American government. They have worked in the prisons. Uh, they have youth programs. Uh, they have a variety of a number of programs which specifically deals with the Japanese Buddhist community. <clears throat> so in America, we have to have people who can deal specifically with the American community, which is very diverse uh, in color, in traditions, in culture, and in all these things. And since 1973, the teachings of the Buddha has been taught exactly the way they have been left with us. The interpretation of them fits the needs of the people. Uh, one of the things in traditional uh, Buddhism we will find is that we have a tendency to take the Buddhist teachings according to the letter. The, in America, Mahayana Buddhists is closer to Catholics. Theravada Buddhists is closer to fundamentalists. And you can see this. When the fundamentalist reads uh, teaches from the Bible, it's according to letter. When the Catholic teaches according uh, to the Bible, it is according to the spirit. How to apply it now in 1990 or uh, 1991. Uh, as far as attachment is concerned, we all have to work towards being detached. Even the Buddhist monks have to work towards this detachment. We have to, everyone as a human being has to work towards detachment. There's a Zen story about this Zen monk was in the boat with his master. And this monk says, I am not detached to anything. I have attained to Satori, which means he had had a glimpse of enlightenment. So his master, grabbed him, threw him off the boat, held him under water for about uh, maybe almost a minute, a minute. Then he let him up. And the master says, are you still not attached? He says, no, master. The only thing that I was attached to at that time was to get another breath of life. So we are attached to things until the last breath of life. The attachment means that we do not cover where this house, 
this money, this wife, this family means more to us than anything in life. Where we will go to an extreme, you through greed, through hatred, you know, to cover, to hold something so tightly that we can't live without it. This is the type of detachment the Buddha is talking about. We have to be attached to life. We have to be attached to breath, to eating, to sleeping, all the normal things in life. And this is how we take the spirit of the teachings of the Buddha and apply them to our society now without diluting the teachings of the Buddha. The teachings of the Buddha is very clear and very pure, so we cannot really dilute his teachings. If we dilute his teachings and we try to practice a diluted form of the teachings, then we, ourselves as individuals, without see the results of that particular religious practice. Just now I heard Japanese government forced the monks to get married. I don't know why this government doesn't force us to get married. <laughs> to wait and see. <laughs> anyway, your question is a very a meaningful question. Actually, it is not necessary for us to borrow the same uh, name as ministers, as Buddhist ministers. We have a very beautiful and meaningful name instead of ministers, anagarik. Anagarika means person who has reduced all his attachment, obligation, responsibilities toward his property and family and maintain free mind, dedicated his life or her life to serve the public as well as religion. It's called anagarik. So uh, still they have certain freedom that they can enjoy. Uh, where monks were not allowed. That is why they remain as anagarikas. They are harmless and they are not uh, any immoral practices but very meaningful and simple way of life. So those who like to dedicate their life to serve cultivate their way of life, at the same time to do some service to this religion without shaving their head, without changing their clothing into saffron colors, pure white clothing. Then people can recognize that this person has renounced so many things and he is a harmless, reliable, honest person. So, not necessary to use the word minister. So we can settle this problem very easily. Back in 1973, uh, when we, um, the program was first instituted, they had to have studies in Buddhism. Now the first group of people that was interested in this were university professors who have received uh, PhDs and things in Buddhist studies, like in Japan, uh, different Sri Lanka, different countries. And they were teaching Buddhism <coughs> in the university or they were in the field of psychology. But they were already married. They were practicing Buddhists. Um, <coughs> They already were trying to introduce Buddhism into American society. So they set up a training program. Now it takes seven years to become like a Buddhist minister. It also takes seven years if you want to become a Buddhist monk, seven years. Uh, the reason for that is that religion in America re attracts certain types who might have certain problems or later they might not want to uh, live the monk's life and things. Um, Americans are not used to what we call tea board in Thailand, the temporary monks, where you can become a monk for a short period of time, 10 to 15 years, then you can disrobe and go back into lay life. The Westerner, they're not used to that. Um, <coughs> 
years old, when this program was devised, you go to a complete training program, just like you was a, a royal Buddhist monk, except you would give 50% of your time to the temple because you had a family. You had to attend to your job. So you would give 50%. The Buddhist monks gave 100%. You know, some Buddhist monks give 75%. And the Anagarikas, uh, the Buddhist ministers, gave 50% of their time. Three months training program in the rain retreats, they had to participate. So this is something that you would have to discuss with your mate if you were married. You see what I mean? The two of you would have to work together. In Japan, <clears throat> when a Zen monk finishes his training, then he goes to the Zen, he gets married. He marries the daughter of a Zen priest who is already trained to work with him, you see. So the system is very well set in Japan. But in America, and perhaps in a country like this, it's not like that. And American women are not like Asian women. Uh, so there's a lot of difficulties there. So when you find two people who are living a life together and practicing a religion together, they work closely hand in hand to help spread that religion um, <clears throat> and work with other married couples and things as well. So it's a work an intense training program, just like if you wanted to become a Buddhist monk. You know, it's the same type of training. And it's just that the precepts and things that you take are, are different. And they are very valuable, especially in our society. They are extremely valuable in our society. Even though in America there's a movement of Westerners who have come to Thailand, became monks for a number of years, gone back to America and disrobed become meditation teachers, huh? They become meditation teachers in America, and you can go and take a meditation course with them, a retreat with them, from 800 to $1,000 for the retreat. But this is only for the yuppie set. You see what I mean? This is for the yuppie set. Buddhism is something that we don't sell, but it is something that we give freely to everyone. So this is an offset. So this, there's a group of seculars who says, we must have secular Buddhism in America. We don't need monks in America, you see. So we counteract that by having the Anagarikas, or the Buddhist ministers, as well as the Buddhist monks, as well as Buddhist nuns. We have done one other thing <coughs> that no one else dared to do <laughs> within the Buddhist system is, uh, and this last year, and this is including all the Buddhists in America now, every tradition, especially Theravada tradition, because this concerns Theravada, this issue. We have just had the uh, Upasampada for the first two American bhikkhunis. You see, this is, this is very touchy here. Uh, and the reason for that is when the Indian nuns and the nuns from Sri Lanka went into China. Those nuns have preserved their lineage. Their lineage is pure. Normally when uh, Chinese women become nuns, they stay nuns for life. And their lineage, lineage is totally pure, is a pure lineage. And so we have devised that in America for America. You see what I mean? So this is another step that we have taken too but with the support of the whole Buddhist Sangha, all the traditions, everyone attended that last year. Everyone attended that one. Sāpāsakthā jibhūvattā devā nāgā mahiddhikā puñyantaṁ anamūdhittvā chiraṁ rakhaṁ tulokha sāsanaṁ ittā utā chammi Sambhatam punya sampadam sabbidiva anudantu sabbha sampatidhya Devo asatu kalena sasu sampatidhya chepito bhavatu lokut Raja bhavatu dhammiko idhamo nyati nangotu sakita untu nyatayo 